3, October. The time seems terribly long whilst we were waiting for the coming of Goodalman and Quincy Morris. The professor tried to keep my mind active by using them all the time. I could see his beneficent purpose by the side glances which he threw from time to time at Harker. The poor fellow is overwhelmed in a misery that is appalling to see. Last night he was a frank, happy looking man, with a strong, youthful face, full of energy, and with dark brown hair. Today he is a drawn, haggard old man. His white hair matches well with the hollow bed and eyes and grief written lines of his face. His energy is still intact. In fact, he is like a living flame. This may yet be his salvation. For, if all go well, it will tide him over the despairing period. He will then, in a kind of way, wake again to the realities of life. Poor fellow. I thought my own trouble was bad enough. But his... The professor knows this well enough, and is doing his best to keep his mind active. What he has been saying was, under the circumstances, of absorbing interest. So well as I can remember, here it is. I have studied over and over again since they came into my hands all the papers relating to this monster, and the more I have studied, the greater seems the necessity to utterly stamp him out. All true, there are signs of his advance, not only of his power, but of his knowledge of it, as I learned from the researches of my friend Arminius of Budapest. He was in life a most wonderful man, soldier, statesman, and alchemist, which latter was the highest development of the science knowledge of his time. He had a mighty brain, a learning beyond compare, and a heart that knew no fear and no remorse. He dared even to attend the scholomance, and there was no branch of knowledge of his time that he did not essay. Well, in him, the brain powers survived the physical death, though it would seem that memory was not all complete. In some faculties of mind, he has been and is only a child, but he is growing, and some things that were childish at the first are now of man's stature. He is experimenting, and doing it well, and if it had not been that we have crossed his path, he would be yet, he may be yet, if we fail, the father or furtherer of a new order of beings, whose road must lead through death, not life, Hawker groaned and said. And this is all right, I guess, my darling. But how is he experimenting? The knowledge may help us to defeat him. He has, all along, since his coming, been trying his power, slowly but surely. That big child brain of his is working. Well, for us, it is, as yet, a child brain, for had he dared at the first to attempt certain things, he would long ago have been beyond our power. However, he means to succeed, and the man who has centuries before him can afford to wait and to go slow. Festina Lente may well be his motto. I fail to understand, said Harker wearily. Oh, do be more plain to me. Perhaps grief and trouble are dull in my brain. The professor let his hand tenderly over his shoulder as he spoke. Ah, my child, I will be plain. Do you 
not see how, of late, this monster has been creeping into knowledge experimentally. How he has been making use of the zoophagus patient to effect his entry into friend John's home for her vampire, though in all afterwards he can come when and how he will, must at the first make entry only when asked thereto by an inmate. But these are not his most important experiments. Do we not see how, at first, all these so great boxes were moved by others? He knew not then, but that must be so. But all the time, that so great child brain of his was growing, and he began to consider whether he might not himself move the box. So, he began to help. And then, when he found that this be all right, he tried to move them all alone. And so, he progressed, and he scattered these graves of him, and none but he know where they are hidden. He may have intended to bury them deep in the ground, so that he only used them in the night, or at such time as he can change his form, they do him equal well. And none may know these are his hiding place. But, my child, do not despair. This knowledge come to him just too late. Already all of his lairs but one be sterilized as for him, and before the sunset this shall be so. Then he have no place where he can move and hide. I delayed this morning that so we might be sure. Is there not more at stake for us than him? Then why we not be even more careful than him. By my clock, it is one hour. And already, if all be well, friend Arthur and Quincy are on their way to us. Today is our day. And we must go sure, if slow, and lose no chance. See, there are five of us. When those absent ones return. Whilst he was speaking, we were startled by a knock at the hall door. The double postman's knock of the telegraph boy. We all moved out of the hall with one impulse, and when Helsing, holding out his hand to us to give silence, stepped through the door and opened it. The boy handed in the dispatch. The professor closed the door again and, after looking at the direction, opened it and read it aloud. Look out for D. He has just now, 12.45, come from Carfax hurriedly and hastened towards the south. He seems to be going around and may want to see you. Mina. There was a pause, a broken by Jonathan Harker's voice. Now, God be thanked, we shall soon meet. When Helsing turned to him quickly and said, God will act in his own way and time. Do not fear and do not rejoice as yet, for what we wish for at the moment may be our undoings. I care for nothing now, he answered haughtily, except to wipe out this brute from the face of creation. I would sell my soul to do it. Oh, hush, hush, my child, said my Helsing. God does not purchase souls in despise, and the devil, though he may purchase, does not keep faith. But God is merciful and just, and knows your pain and your devotion to that dear Madame Mina. Think you 
her pain would be doubled did she but hear your wild birds. Do not fear any of us. We are all devoted to this cause, and today shall see the end. The time is coming for action. Today, this vampire is limited to the powers of man, and till sunset, he may not change. It will take him time to arrive here. See, it is twenty minutes past one, and there are yet some times before he can hither come. Be he never so quick. What we must hope for is that my lord Arthur and Quincy arrive first. About half an hour after we had received Mrs. Harker's telegram, there came a quiet resolute knock at the hall door. It was just an ordinary knock, such as is given hourly by thousands of gentlemen, but it made the professor's heart and mind bit loudly. We looked at each other, and together moved out into the hall. We each held ready to use the various armaments, the spiritual in the left hand, or the mortal in the right. Van Helsing pulled back the latch, and, holding the door half open, stood back, having both hands ready for action. The gladness of our hearts must have shown upon our faces, when on the stair, close to the door, we saw Lord Godalming and Chrissy Morris. I came quickly in and closed the door behind them, with the former saying as they moved along the hall. It is all right. We found both places, six boxes in each, and we destroyed them all. Destroyed? asked the professor. For him? We were silent for a minute, and then Quincy said, Oh, there's nothing to do but to wait here. If, however, he doesn't turn up by five o'clock, we must start off. For it won't do to leave Mrs. Harger alone after sunset. He will be here before long now, said Van Helsing. I had been consulting his pocketbook. Not a penny. In Madame's telegram, he went south from Carfax. That means he went to cross the river, and he could only do so at slack of tide, which should be something before one o'clock. That he went south has a meaning for us. He is as yet only suspicious, and he went from Carfax first to the place where he would suspect interference least. We must have been at Bermondsey only a short time before him. That he is not here already shows that he went to Mile End next. This took him some time, for he would then have to be carried over the river in some way. Believe me, my friends, we shall not have long to wait now. We should have ready some plan of attack, so that we may throw away no chance. Hush, there is no time now. Have all of your arms. Be ready. He held up a one in hand as he spoke for we all could hear a key softly inserted in the lock of the hall door. I could not but admire, even at such a moment, the way in which dominant spirit asserted itself. In all the hearty parties and adventures in different parts of the world, Quincy Morris had always been the one to arrange the plan of action, and Arthur and I had been accustomed to obey him implicitly. Now the old habit seemed to be renewed instinctively. With a swift glance from the room, he at once laid out a plan of attack and, without speaking a word, with a gesture, placed us each in position. Van Helsing, Harker, and I were just behind the door, so that when it was open, the professor could guard it, whilst we two stepped between the income and the door, good arming, behind, and Quincy in front, stood just out of sight, ready to move in front of the window, waited in a suspense that made the seconds pass with nightmare slowness. And the slow, careful steps came along the hall, 
the count was evidently prepared for some surprise. At least he feared it. Suddenly, with a single bound, he leaped into the room, winning away past us before any of us could raise a hand to stay him. There was something so panther-like in the movement, something so unhuman, that it seemed to sober us all from the shock of his coming. The first to act was Harker, who with a quick movement threw himself before the door leading into the room in front of the house. As the Count saw us, a horrible sort of snarl passed away his face, showing the eye teeth long and pointed, but the evil smile as quickly passed into a cold stare of lion-like disdain. His expression again changed as, with a single impulse, we all advanced upon him. It was a pity that we had not some better organized plan of attack, for even at the moment I wondered what we were to do. I did not myself know whether a lethal weapon would avail us anything. Harker evidently meant to try the matter, for he had ready his great cookery knife, and made a fierce and sudden cut at him. Well, the blow was a powerful one. Only the diabolical quickness of the Count's leap back saved him. A second less, and the trenchant blade has shone through his heart. As it was, the point just cut the cloth of his coat, making a wide gap once the bundle of banknotes and the stream of gold fell out. The expression of the Count's face was so hellish. Ah, for a moment, I feared for Harker. They saw him throw the terrible knife aloft again for another stroke. Instinctively, I moved forward with a protective impulse, holding the crucifix and wafer in my left hand. I felt a mighty power fly along my arm, and it was without surprise I saw the monster cower back before a similar movement made spontaneously by each one of us. It would be impossible to describe the expression of hate and baffled malignity, of hunger and hellish rage, which came over the Count's face. His waxen hue became greenish-yellow by the contrast of his burning eyes, and the red scar on the forehead showed on the pallid skin like a palpitating wound. The next instant, with a sinuous dive, he swept under Harker's arm, ere his blow could fall, and, gasping a handful of the money from the floor, dashed across the room, threw himself out the window. Amid the crash and glitter of the falling glass, he tumbled into the flagged area below. From the sound of the shivering glass, I could hear the ting of the gold, as some of the sovereigns fell on the flagging, run over and saw him spring and hurt from the ground. He, rushing up the steps, closed the flagged yard and pushed open the stable door. And there he turned and spoke to us. You think to baffle me. You, with your pale faces all in a row, like sheep in a butcher's. You shall be sorry yet. Each one of you. You think you have left me without a place to rest. But I have more. My revenge has just begun. I spread it over centuries, and time is on my side. Your girls that you all love are mine already, and through them you and others shall yet be mine. My creatures, to do my bidding and to be my jackals when I want to feed. Bah! With a contemptuous sneer, he passed quickly through the door, and we heard the rusty vault creak as he fastened it behind him. The door beyond opened and shut. The first of us to speak was the professor, as, realizing the difficulty of following him through the stable, we moved towards the hall. We have learned something. Much. Not fit standing, has brave birds. He fears us. He fear time. He fear a wand. For if not, why he harry so? His very tone betray him. Or my ears deceive. Why take that money? Do you? Follow quick. 
you are hunters of wild beasts and understand it so. For me, I make sure that nothing higher may be of use to him. If so, that he return. As he spoke, he put the money remaining into his pocket, took the title deeds and the bundles Hulk had left them, and swept the remaining things into the open fireplace where he set fire to them with a match. But Almy and Maurice had rushed out into the yard, and Harker had lowered himself from the window to follow the count. He had, however, bolted the stable door, and by the time they had forced it open, there was no sign of him. When Helsing and I tried to make inquiry at the back of the house, the dim news was deserted, and no one had seen him depart. It was now late in the afternoon, and sunset was not far off. We had to recognize that our game was up. With heavy hearts, we agreed with the professor when he said, Let us go back to Madame Mina. Poor, poor, dear Madame Mina. All we can do just now is done. And we can dare, at least, protect her. But we need not despair. There is but one more earth box, and we must try to find it. When that is done, all may yet be well. I could see that he spoke as bravely as he could to comfort Harker. The poor fellow was quite broken down. Now and again he gave a low groan which he could not suppress. He was thinking of his wife. We saw at hearts who came back to my house, where we found Mrs. Harker waiting us with an appearance of cheerfulness which did honour to her bravery and unselfishness. When she saw our faces, her own became as pale as death. For a second or two, her eyes were closed as she were in secret prayer. And then, she said cheerfully, I can never thank you all enough. Oh, my poor darling. As she spoke, she took her husband's grey head in her hands and kissed it. Lay your poor head here and rest it. All will yet be well, dear. God will protect us, if he so will it in his good intent. The poor fellow only groaned. There is no place for words in his sublime misery. We had a sort of perfunctory supper together, and I think it cheered us all up somewhat. It was, perhaps, the mere animal heat of food to hungry people, for none of us had eaten anything since breakfast, or the sense of companionship may have helped us, but anyhow, we were all less miserable, and saw the morrow as not altogether without hope. True to her promise, we told Mrs. Harker everything which had passed, and although she grew snowy white at times when danger had seemed to threaten her husband, and red at others when his devotion to her was manifested, she listened bravely and with calmness. When we came to the part where Hagar had rushed at the count so recklessly, she clung to her husband's arm and held it tight, as though her clinging could protect him from any harm that might come. She said nothing, however, till the narration was all done, and matters had been brought right up to the present time. And then, without letting go of her husband's hand, she stood up amongst us and spoke. Oh, that I could give any idea of the scene. Of that sweet, sweet, good, good woman, and all the radiant beauty of her youth and animation, with the red scar on her forehead of which she was conscious, and which we saw with grinding of her teeth, remembering whence and how it came. Her loving kindness against the grim hate, her tender faith against all our fears and doubting, and we knowing that so far as symbols went, she, with all her goodness and purity and faith, was outcast from God. Jonathan, she said, and the words sounded like music on her lips. It was so full of love and tenderness. Jonathan, dear, and you, all my true, true friends, I want you to bear something in mind through all this dreadful time. I know that you must fight, that you must destroy even as you destroyed the false Lucy, so that the true Lucy might live hereafter. But it is not a work of hate. That poor soul who has wrought all this misery is the saddest case of all. Just think what will be his joy when he too is destroyed, 
and his worse part, that his better part may have spiritual immortality. You must be pitiful to him, too, though it may not hold your hands from his destruction. But she spoke, I could see her husband's face darken and draw together, as though the passion in him was shriveling his being to its core. Instinctively, the clasp of his wife's hand grew closer, till his knuckles looked white. She did not flinch from the pain which I knew she must have suffered, but looked at him with eyes that were more appealing than ever. As she stopped speaking, he leaped to his feet, almost tearing his hand from hers as he spoke. May God give him into my hand, just for long enough to destroy that earthy life of him which we are aiming at. If beyond it, I could send his soul forever and ever to burn in hell, I would do it. Oh, hush! Oh, hush! In the name of the good God! Don't say such things, Jonathan, my husband, or you will crush me with fear and horror. Just think, my dear, I have been thinking all this long, long day of it. That, perhaps, some day, I too may need such pity, and that some other, like you, and with equal cause for anger, may deny it to me. Oh, my husband, my husband, indeed, I would have spared you such a thought, had there been another way. But I pray that God may not have treasured your wild words, except as the heartbroken wail of a very loving and sorely stricken man. Oh, God, let these poor white hairs go in evidence of what he has suffered who all his life has done no wrong, and on whom so many sorrows have come. We men were all in tears now. There was no resisting them, but we wept openly. She wept, too, to see that her sweet counsels had prevailed. Her husband flung himself on his knees beside her, and putting his arms around her, hid his face in the folds of her dress. Van Helsing beckons to us, and we stole out of the room leaving the two loving hearts alone with their god. Before they retire, the professor fixed up the room against any coming of the vampire, and assured Mrs. Harker that she might rest in peace. She tried to school herself to the belief, and, manifestly for her husband's sake, tried to seem content. It was a brave struggle, and was, I think I believe, not without its reward. When Helsing had placed a tiny bell, which either of them was to sound in case of any emergency. When they had retired, Quincy, Godalming, and I arranged that we should sit up, dividing the night between us, and watch over the safety of the poor stricken lady. The first watch falls to Quincy, so the rest of us shall be off to bed as soon as we can. Godalming has already turned in, for his is the second watch. Now that my walk is done, I, too, shall go to bed.